Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, for those I haven't met, I'm Patrick Miller, Assistant Director in the Center for Digital Strategy. Um, for today's uh, event, we're really excited. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, energy and excitement around campus when we start to talk about blockchain and, and crypto and fintech. And we're really excited to be able to bring today uh, Eric Van Milford from Ripple, who you know not only plays in that space, but actually has a, a really sound business product with a business model that solves really important business challenges. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Eric. To, uh, please join me in welcoming Eric back to the top. Thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, thank you for organizing the day. Thank you to, to, to Robin. I've already had a, a great morning chatting with a lot of students. It's a treat to, to come back to Hanover. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you, you actually have some nice weather for me when I'm back here, because that <laughs> it creates a, literally a, a warm welcome. As, as Patrick said, um, you know, I, I want to keep this pretty casual. I have a set of slides, probably take half an hour or so. And my goal there is to give you just a little bit of background on me uh, and sort of the journey that I took post-Tuck and how I got to where I am today. Certainly would like to share a little bit about, about Ripple and what we're doing um, and our take on deploying blockchain technology to solve a real world, world problem. I won't be, maybe to much chagrin, talking a lot about ICOs or the latest hype around coins or when Bitcoin's going to fork again. Um, we can talk about that during Q&A, but I'd like to kind of focus today more on, on what I think is a real world application of blockchain technology and how it can make a, a, a real big difference going forward. Um, and then leave plenty of time open for questions. Caveats at the start, I, I am truly a tech grad. I'm not a tech guy. I'm not going to be able to get deep into all the nuances of blockchain. I can kind of kind of go far enough to be dangerous. So don't hesitate to ask questions, but I, I want to kind of think more about the, the strategy and how we go about um, deploying blockchain in a meaningful way. So this image can either be the road less traveled or the long and winding road, which I guess the folks that helped me put this together meant to kind of uh, typify my post-Tuck career. <laughs> I, I, I came out of Tuck, uh, the dark ages, 91 I graduated. Uh, as we were talking about at breakfast, there was actually a recession going on in 1991. About 30 some odd percent of my classmates, including myself, left Tuck without a job, which was really, really scary given the amount of money that you invest to come here and you think you're going to get that degree and you're going to be in demand. And so I packed up and I went out to uh, the West Coast, which is where I, I, I grew up. And um, you know, by the fall, I was working in a tiny boutique uh, strategy consulting firm called Windermere Associates, about 10 professionals kind of doing what MBAs do. You go and you consult and you work on big problems with big companies. And I figured out in two or three years that just for me, that wasn't the thing. And now it's like 1995 and this thing called the internet sort of coming around. Sounds interesting. And I, I know nothing about the internet, but just uh, you know, pre-LinkedIn, start smiling and dialing and it was able to uh, land a job at a dial-up ISP. Um, which is hard to believe right now, but at the time was pretty darn cool. Um, getting people onto the internet, what was a browser, uh, how do you use email, how does that all work, and how does it make an impact? And you know, I was fortunate to hook up with, with a boss and a mentor that I worked with for a while. And you know, I started off doing what we called, uh, I think we called it business planning and management. So you know, taking my smart business guy skills and uh, trying to insert them in a space that was kind of the Wild West. There wasn't a whole lot of measurement and process and trying to balance the need for putting some structure around things without being so bureaucratic that you slow down the, the, the ability to be nimble and entrepreneurial. So, uh, you know, it has been a long and winding road. I've worked for companies as large as Yahoo with uh, 13,000 employees. I've been employee number eight at a startup. The common thread has always been this combination of what I guess today we call business operations, but business development, strategy, corporate development. Um, you know, I've, I've embraced being a generalist. I, I had opportunities to go deep into marketing or go deep into, um, you know, kind of go down a CFO path, both of which are fantastic. But for me, I really enjoyed kind of carving a slightly new path. And this, this function of business operations, I think is now more commonplace. It's this intersection of, I think, internal consulting, strategy, um, 
kind of keeping the business part of the business moving forward. And it's, you know, I, I, I've been fortunate to kind of, uh, you know, insert that ability at a couple of different places. I'll call out a few and then try to bring it full circle to what we'll talk about today at Ripple. Um, you know, first, way back in the late 90s, I worked for a company called At Home, which became Excited Home. And you guys, most of you probably weren't even born um, back then. But we were the first, uh, um, you know, company that was bringing broadband internet via cable modems to consumers in the United States. So you know, the first intersection was sort of old school companies trying to do digital transformations with, with cable companies, right? They had actually pretty successful businesses bringing uh, you know, uh, uh, video entertainment to the masses. Uh, they saw an ability to generate a new revenue stream, but a very different old school way of thinking. Um, we were kind of this brash, new, totally bubble era, era internet company. And uh, it was fascinating to watch that transformation to help them think through that. Unfortunately, I think they thought through it enough that they realized they could kind of suck the technology out of the company and do it on their own. As a result, uh, Excited Home was truly a poster child for the, 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 that Web 1.0 era. We went public in 97. I mean, the stock went through the roof. Um, we hired a ton of people, we built huge buildings, and then the bubble burst, and then the company basically imploded. Um, the, the, the cable companies truly sucked the IP out of that. Now you have Comcast and TCI and Cox Cable all running their own <laughs> broadband uh, businesses now, both for consumers and for, uh, for enterprise, making a lot of money, and unfortunately, the, the, in, in, in the uh, Somewhere in the, the, the scrap pile of, of uh, Internet 1.0 is that company. But an interesting uh, process and a lesson you learn going forward. The other one I'll, I'll call out is at Yahoo. Um, I had a couple of different roles, but one was working on a major project we had with the newspaper industry. Uh, you know, another old school industry trying to figure out how to s not only survive, but try to thrive in the, the Internet age. and. Um, in some ways, Yahoo was, was, was the antichrist. It was the company that was taking all of their users and all of the ad dollars and moving it away from them. But they realized, at least a small group within a lot of these newspaper companies realized, hey, we either can, can go down the road that leads to a not so good outcome, or we can try to partner and learn. So you know, I put together a partnership with about a dozen different newspapers across the United States, from Hearst to also Cox, another kind of uh, intersection there, uh, Belo down in, in Texas, to they leveraged our search technology, our, our ad serving technology. We took their original local content and displayed it to our users. So it was a, it was a, a again, another um, valuable lesson of how to try to take a, a, an industry that was really confronting how do, you, how do you make it to the next level, how do you embrace technology and not get lost in the mix. And that kind of leads to today, and um, you know, I'm at a company called Ripple. And just for background, Ripple is a later stage startup. We have about 220 people. We're, we're, we're headquartered in San Francisco, right in the heart of the financial district. We develop uh, enterprise software that we serve banks and other financial institutions uh, specifically to help um, pain points involved with payments, and even more specifically, cross-border payments, moving money uh, around the world more efficiently than it, it happens today. Um, it is, again, kind of, you know, sometimes uh, life repeats itself, uh, working with a set of companies and institution that's been around not decades, but centuries in many cases, and uh, they're dealing with technology that isn't necessarily in the 21st century always, and how do they, how do they embrace that without getting disintermediated and um, kind of losing their identity and business model around the way. Uh, so anyway, that's enough about me. Let's, let's get going on what we do. Our mission at Ripple is to create something uh, we call the Internet of Value. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about that in just a second. I think it, we leverage the blockchain. We leverage blockchain technology. As, as Patrick was saying at the start, Everybody wants to talk about blockchain. The hype around blockchain is really off the charts. And I, having enough gray hair to have been through Web 1.0, we saw 
well, those of us that were around, saw pets.com, we saw Webvan. Um, 90% of the companies that just put a .com after the name didn't really need to, or maybe they needed to, but they did it in the wrong way. And I, ha having kind of been to this movie before, I see a lot of the same hype existing around the blockchain today. I think it'll be as impactful as the internet was impactful for society. Um, I also think that there is a lot of stuff going on that doesn't make any sense, that doesn't require the blockchain. Um, you know, a database often works just fine for a lot of the things people are trying to do. And so what I'd like to highlight uh, as we chat today is how, uh, at least from my perspective, Ripple is tackling a, a very specific real world problem and doing so in a way that I think is gonna make a, a really dramatic impact. So before I get into exactly what we do, I'm gonna take a step back and talk a little bit more strategically. If you think, um, hopefully this isn't gonna get too too high level and, and, and uh, uh, squishy. But if you think about, about major trends that have happened that have, have, have helped sort of the global economy grow and actually work, I, I'd argue there's three components that are critical to actually tr create that, that, that kind of economic globalism. And two of them we've checked off. One I don't think we have, and, and it has to do with the internet of value. So, um, the first one, interesting fact about this picture, this was taken the year that I graduated from Tuck. <laughs> For a little more laughter there, damn. Um, so uh, what does it have to do with anything? So shipping, if you think about shipping of physical goods, if you look back, I think this picture was probably taken, I don't know, early, early 20th century. Shipping physical goods was hard, not only because we didn't have, have airplanes and whatnot, but when you think about how packaging of physical goods happened, there was no rhyme nor reason. You know, the goods came and from all different parts of the world. There was different methodologies, shipment. It was super expensive and prohibitive. And as a result, a lot of commerce didn't happen. Things didn't move across the world simply because the economics associated with making that happen was, was, didn't make sense. You couldn't make the business model work. So in the 1950s, voila, the shipping container. Like, you look at a shipping container, it's just a big metal box, right? Well, actually, it was a huge innovation. The shipping container was standardized around the world and it kind of revolutionized how physical goods were transported. And there's a word I'll, word I'll use a few times here and that's interoperability. So kind of component one of, of making it a truly efficient global economy is interoperability of physical goods. And I'd argue that the innovation of the shipping container was a fundamental uh, uh, milestone in ensuring that that happened in a way, because when you think about what happens is, I can go anywhere in the world and that shipping container is the same. I can go from factory, putting that shipping container on a truck that goes to a train, that goes to a cargo ship, that ship goes to a new port in a totally different spot in the world. It'll be the same infrastructure that has been built around that allows the logistics around shipping to happen in a far more efficient way. And there's statistics that show in a 20 year period, I, I, frankly, I don't know if it's from you know, the, the 50s or the 70s or the 60s, or the 80s, there was a 700% increase in the, the transport of goods in, in North America, in the Northern Hemisphere, I should say, not North America, that can be traced back to the fact that we have this interoperability with physical goods. So I think one, physical good interoperability, check. That happened, it's pretty impressive. I don't have a bunch of fancy pictures for the next one, but you guys, have lived through some of it yourself, and that's the interoperability of data. So obviously the internet has been transformational. We have the ability now not to work in siloed islands of networks where data is contained and moving things from, from one node to another is difficult. We have these standards, just like the shipping container was standardizing how physical goods moved, we have standards that the internet brought us, you know, TCP IP, um, uh, HTTP that allows a web page to load no matter what browser, no matter what internet service provider you have, that allows us to send emails back and forth in a way that you don't even think about it. We take all this for granted, but it really revolutionizes how we can communicate. And so you have um, the, the uh, sort of interoperability of physical goods, you have the interoperability of data. Um, what are we missing? We're, we're missing the interoperability of value the ability to move money around the world as efficiently as data moves around the internet today. It's crazy 
in some ways to think we're in 2018, and if I want to send a 30 gig video clip to Hong Kong, I don't even think about it. I just send it, attach it to an email, uh, upload it to uh, you know Dropbox, and the person on the other end pulls it down. Its marginal cost is basically zero. I know it'll get there in seconds, and I'm about 100% sure it'll happen. Maybe on some case it doesn't. If I want to send $10,000 from Hanover to Hong Kong, honestly, your best bet is to put it in a suitcase and go down to Logan and hop on a plane. It'll get there faster, more reliably, and probably, I don't know about cheaper, the plane ticket might cost you a little bit. But it's really, you know, the, 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 the fact that we live in an internet age, but the infrastructure to support global payments is really based on technology that is 45 years old. It's a little mind blowing. And that's really what, um, I might be off of my slides, that's really what we saw, or I should say the founders of Ripple saw when they created the company. And that's what we'll talk a little bit more now. So to start off with, let's take a look at what is happening on the demand side. So when I'm talking about demands, it's people that are, have a need to send payments. And if you look at this from a, a, a corporate lens, uh, the, the, the profile of the corporate customer that needs to send payments has changed pretty dramatically in the last 20 years. So, uh, you know, these logos obviously are some of the, the, the largest technology companies uh, around the world, and they, they all, um, you know, kind of ha have come into being in this new internet age. And, you know, they have some, um, some interesting characteristics. Let's look at Amazon just as, a, as an example. I think this is relevant for you know, many of the names that were on that list. So I think these numbers are from a couple years back, but you know, the, the sellers, the people that are, are, are selling goods on Amazon come from over 100 different companies around the world. They are sending goods to 185 countries around the world. So the purchasers, the consumers, the retail folks. <coughs> um, and there, in 2015, there was a billion items shipped. I mean, the logistics around that are shocking. So what does that mean? That means Amazon has to figure out how to disperse funds to vendors in 185 countries. Amazon only does disbursements in 19 currencies, which in and of itself is a huge effort for them. That means tons of integrations into different banks. Uh, that means employ, employing literally hundreds of people when, within Amazon to work on payments. That's true. We've talked to people in Uber. We've talked to people in Airbnb. These are not payments companies, but the current infrastructure that exists to serve them isn't adequate to meet the needs that they have. So not only is that a pain for Amazon, but then if you are a vendor in one of those countries that happens not to have the, the good fortune of, of being served with the right currency, you have to go form a banking relationship. You have to deal with the FX rates. You have a whole other set of burdens that you obviously would rather avoid because um, you're trying to run your small business or you know, your shop. So th this, is, this is an evolution that's material. And so I won't go through these in a lot of detail. But what you see is that these companies all were global from day one. It used to be you, 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 you created your company, you had a nice domestic business. If you were fortunate enough to do well, you're like, how do I grow revenue? Well, I move and I, I open a market overseas. Well. With the internet, the people are, are starting to sell overseas from day one. So that's a, that's a very different demand. Um, there's new business models. There, you know, the gig economy, sharing economy. Um, you've got a lot of, of vendors. Uh, there's two million Uber drivers around the world. Um, they want to get paid right away. And they want to get paid in their local currency. Maybe they don't even have a bank account. They want to get paid to their mobile wallet. This is, these are, are, are demands on the payments infrastructure and the payment system that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. Um, you'll hear Ripple use the phrase on the upper right, the first bullet there, high volume, low value, high velocity. So um, what we mean by that is lots and lots of, of low ticket item payments. And that's really, what we'll talk about it in a second, but that's not what the current infrastructure is set up to do. Um, and then there's also this, this idea of visibility. Where, you know, um, we, 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 we use the story uh, sometime in pitches. I, 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 don't, I forget if it's Domino's or Pizza Hut. You know where your pizza is everywhere along the way after you order it. Where is the driver? When's it coming? How's it doing? You send a $10,000 payment through the traditional system. It, it's a little bit like putting an envelope in a mailbox. Not that anybody does that anymore 15 years ago. 
You don't know if it's going to get there. I mean, you have to wait and maybe get a call or a message back from the recipient. Uh, that's a bigger and bigger deal when you're dealing with a lot of small payments going to a multitude, sometimes millions of, um, millions of users. So that's a current reality. Um, of course, we have to talk about another buzzword, but if you look at what's coming in the near future, you know, it's not just people paying people. It's machines interacting with other machines. The Internet of Things is, is upon us, and you know, uh, this, this stat shows that in not that many years, there'll be 50 billion connected devices around the world, and many of them aren't going to be interacting just with people. They'll be interacting with each other. And transactions will happen, and these aren't like big money transactions. We had a group from um, Audi, the car manufacturer, in to the office. I wasn't in the meeting. It was a couple years ago, and it was sort of their future their future innovation team thinking, you know, what's going to happen. And they were talking about they're going to be equipping cars in the future with technology that allows kind of on-demand anything. So if you want to go up to the, the mountains and engage four-wheel drive for the weekend, instead of having to, to kind of pay for a four-wheel drive when you buy the car, it, it's, it'll be there. But if you want to turn it on, you buy it for the weekend. Um, uh, <laughs> there was even an example if you're on the highway, you know, the cars will be able to talk to each other. And if you're in a hurry, you want to pass the car in front of you, you can say, I'll give you 10 cents to move over. <laughs> I don't know if that one's really going to play out, but we're talking about, about payments that are not thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars. They're like cents or fractions of a cent. Machines making calls to another machine, you know, for more processing power or more API calls or what have you. This is coming. And um, the idea of micropayments being at all affordable is, is just not fathomable, fathomable today. So uh, huge volumes, immediate you know, on-demand transactions. You have to make this work at, at a, a fraction of the cost. No tolerance. This, this, this isn't really where we've needed to be as a payments industry, but quickly this is upon us and we'll get even more intense over time. So why doesn't it work? I don't know how many people here are familiar with correspondent banking. Any hands? Anybody? A few? All right. A year and a half ago when I joined Ripple, I certainly was not. And it was an eye-opener to me to see how the, the process works today. H how many people have, have, have wired money overseas, maybe lived overseas? How many people have enjoyed that experience and found it really efficient and whatnot? The, the, it is built. Uh, so Swift is a company. Um, actually, it's a co-op owned by banks. And that's what they do. They have a messaging infrastructure that is default. It's almost the de facto standard that enables uh, cross-border payments. And again, it's 45 years old, and it's a technology that is akin to throwing a letter in, in a post office box. It's a one-way messaging technology. Um, you deal with these intermediary, intermediary banks along the way. And as a result, it's days. Um, my example before about the plane trip to Hong Kong was an exaggeration. It, it, it'll take two, three, maybe more days. And that's if it works on the first try. The failure rates for SWIFT transactions um, are somewhere in the neighborhood of 5%. Now, in Silicon Valley and in technology in general, we talk about four nines of reliability, five nines of re reliability. I mean, we're not even talking about one nine of reliability when it comes to moving people's money around the world in many cases. That's a little bit hard to believe. And this system was built for big chunks of payments that would happen occasionally. So I used the term before, um, low value, high volume payments. That's where the world is moving. This is about high value, low volume payments. I can, I'm a big um, uh, auto manufacturer. I have to pay my, my, my vendor in um, Vietnam. I can send them every two weeks several million dollars, and that's just fine. And in, 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 in for those payments, Swift actually is yeah. relatively efficient. For the new corporates, it's not where the world is going, and we don't think that the, the, the rails, the infrastructure for payments is there to meet that. In addition, and I kind of touched on this already, the correspondent banking system means if, if, if you don't have a direct, if your bank, as let's say that manufacturer that, that is paying a vendor in another country doesn't have a direct banking relationship with that country's, that, that vendor's bank, you have to deal with an intermediary. It kind of daisy chains throughout. And throughout that process, you've got fees that are charged. You have the risk of, of uh, you know, something going wrong and delays. Um, 
overall, it leads to a very, very poor, poor experience. So voila, it took me almost half an hour in a blockchain presentation to start to mention the blockchain. That's great. <laughs> um, why is the blockchain going to help here? So I'm definitely not the person who can give a great textbook definition of the blockchain. You're better off going up to, to the Wikipedia or your favorite website. But it really does revolutionize how transactions are recorded. Obviously, it's a distributed ledger. Um, there's no central counterparty. It's immutable. You can't change it. It is incredibly fast. And it depends on the blockchain. We'll talk about that in a second, how fast it really is. But it lends itself to addressing some of the inefficiencies that exist um, with the current system. Being able to you know, record transactions in, in, in such a way is, is very appealing. And so you know, there's one school of thought that says, well, great, so there's one blockchain. You can do this on Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a blockchain. It was sort of the first, the first, first blockchain. Um, why don't we just leverage that and we can do all this payment stuff on just that? It, this gets back to the analogy of, of, of interoperability. Um, it's unlikely, I think it's almost impossible, that there's going to be one blockchain that is this monolithic thing that is going to be what everybody across the entire world standardizes on. By definition, there will be different ledgers, different blockchains, different networks that exist. So putting the entire world on one blockchain, fundamentally, I don't think it makes sense. It's not how the world is starting to play out. I don't think it's how, how the world will end up being played out. So um, Ripple kind of pioneered this idea of how do, you, how, do you, uh, how do you address that problem? How do you create interoperability between different ledgers, between different payment networks? And so we came up with a protocol, just like there was um, TCP IP for the internet. Um, our engineering team has created something called the Interledger Protocol, or ILP. And the idea <laughs> being that these different networks, blockchain just being one, you know, ACH, which is the sort of money, the intra-country um, check clearing, money moving uh, uh, network here in the United States. Visa is a network. You can argue that HSBC has a, a, a payments network, et cetera, et cetera. There are all these islands right now. And, and sure, you can, you can ask each of these networks to move on the blockchain, but then they're just kind of copying what they're doing and putting it over on a blockchain. There's scalability issues that come up very quickly when that happens. So the idea is just like the internet connected uh, data networks around the world, there should be a, 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 a standard, uh, a protocol that connects these, these value networks, these payment networks. And that's really what the Interledger protocol that, that we've developed and is now open source. It's now out for other people to build on and improve on and deploy. But, but it, it sort of got its, its start within Ripple. And that's really the idea is to create these, these networks so now you can have interaction between the networks and create that efficiency, that interoperability of value that we'd argue is lacking, sort of that third component after the interoperability of goods, the interoperability of data. You need the interoper uh, interoperability of, of um, value. And just like you needed standards for those other two, you need standards for this and the ability to, to leverage something like the Interledger protocol to do that is super and super important. And so now here's the, the nice, pretty future state world. It's all interconnected <laughs> and whatnot. We don't need to spend a lot of time on that. <laughs> so um, how am I doing on time? I, 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 I don't intend, I didn't intend to, and hopefully this isn't coming up at all as a, a Ripple commercial, but I want to share with you a little bit more specifically how we try to tackle the problem, what products we have in the market, and, and, and how we're going about tackling uh, the opportunity. So, um, you know, we are trying to, to uh, we work at, at the infrastructure layer. We're down at the plumbing. We're not creating the fancy user-facing applications. We're not a PayPal or a Venmo or anything like that. Um, those applications are great, but they're really just the veneer. They're still working on the same rails, the same payments infrastructure. We're trying to work at that plumbing level and create a new, far more efficient rail for payments to move around the world. So I talked about standardization, this idea that there's, there's APIs um, that work, but it goes beyond that. And I'll talk about you know, governance and, and rules in a second. Speed, uh, it's just not acceptable that, that payments moving across the world take two, three, sometimes more days. Um, 
certainty, the idea that when you start a payment, you've done what you need to do on both ends such that it's, it's an atomic payment, it means it, you, you know if it starts, it will complete and it will be successful. And we, we do, I'll touch a little bit on it, but I won't get too, it's a little inside baseball to go too far into that, so I'll, I won't go too deep. And then cost, I mean, you know, having straight through processing rates, eliminating middlemen certainly cuts out fees and creates a far more efficient business model. And again, all this together, you know, it's enabling the economics around payments that, uh, you know, at a certain small fractions of dollars amounts used to be, you couldn't even fathom making that work. It makes it much more possible. It has impacts not only on that, uh, that Internet of Things example, but if you even think about financial inclusion and in parts of the world where banks today <coughs> can't justify the business model to serve certain populations, um, if you think about a payment system that's far more efficient, then it opens up possibilities to do a whole lot of things in developing economies, et cetera, et cetera. So we brought to market, really, we have a, a portfolio of three products. Um, our flagship product is something we call XCurrent, and that really deals the, the bottom two layers of this uh, stack here. The settlement infrastructure, that's where we use um, the blockchain technology. It's working between the ledgers of, of, of two financial institutions and, and kind of integrating at their core ledger, way down in the guts of, of, of the banking infrastructure, and then ensuring that there's the cryptography that allows them certainty um, uh, that that payment actually settles. So we do sort of pre-processing and holding of funds in a way such that we make sure that the, combined with the messaging, so the messaging part is what replaces what SWIFT does, but it's not, SWIFT is a unidirectional messaging, back to the letter in the post office or the post box example, you don't really know. We have a bi-directional, very robust um, messaging infrastructure so that if you fat finger a account number, you get information bank like, no, no, that's the wrong number. Obviously, if you have a, a one-way messaging system and you put the wrong account number, there's no return path to let you know, hey, whoa, don't send that, we don't have an account uh, that matches that number. So this, this allows the payment processing to happen. It amount, the messaging happens efficiently, the set, settlement happens within eight seconds, roughly, um, which is a dramatic change from what exists today. Um, that's the bits and bytes, that's the software we implement. In addition, we realized pretty quickly that since we're working with financial institutions, um, we're trying to create a network. We're trying to create a whole um, portfolio of institutions because they're all gonna be transacting with each other. They need a set of rules and governance in order to do that efficiently, or else then every time somebody came and joined RippleNet, they'd have to go create a new bilateral relationship with whoever their counterparty is. That's a lot of friction in the system. So we created a common rule set working with our bank partners that allow them to know that whenever I sign up with Ripple, um, everybody else that signed up with Ripple is operating off of the same rules. So it gives me certainty and peace of mind. So that all those things together kind of create our first product. How do we use digital currencies? This is where actually the an asset called XRP that we, um, we happen to own quite a bit of um, and are a, a big champion of comes into play. The messaging, the settlement addresses some big pain points in that cross-border payment flow. What it doesn't address is liquidity. And by liquidity, it just means, are the funds where they need to be in the right denomination to actually make that payout? And what happens today in the correspondent banking system <coughs> is there is the need for the sending bank actually to have opened up a bank account with the receiving bank. It's called a Nostro account, Latin for R. So it's our account, I'm Wells Fargo, I want to set up an account with Standard Chartered in Singapore. I actually go and I put funds in that Nostro account. Wells Fargo parks capital in that foreign account, waiting for the Wells Fargo customer to come and say, hey, I have a vendor in Southeast Asia, take, um, uh, shoot, I should have used Thailand because I know it's Thai bot, I forget the currency in, in Malaysia, um, but take um, the local currency and pay out that partner. And of course, Wells Fargo doesn't have to only do that with Standard Chartered in Singapore, it has to do that with dozens if not hundreds of other correspondent banking partners around the world. That's a hugely inefficient use of capital. Um, so how, how, how can we make that better? So we have a product called XRapid that allows um, banks to avoid that scenario. So if 
um, Wells Fargo and Stand holds XRP, and the bank in uh, Standard Chartered in Singapore also deals in XRP, they can simply send that money over the blockchain, uh, the XRP ledger, which is the blockchain that supports the currency XRP, in a matter of seconds. And instead of having to hold currencies in dozens and dozens of different countries, they are um, only holding one currency and the, 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 the time required to move money from one place to other goes down to literally seconds. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a dramatic um, shift in, in thinking and a dramatic shift in the demands required of capital um, uh, needs around the world. And it addresses you know, kind of, I'd say, the, the, the third big pain point associated with cross-border payments. Now, banks are regulated, conservative, and they're not yet embracing digital currency. So the Ripple software works fiat to fiat. You don't need to send digital currency around. You can send US dollars to Japanese yen, et cetera, et cetera. But kind of the secret sauce, or taking it to the next level, is by leveraging a digital asset to make that transaction much more efficient. Yes? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So in order to, to transact with, um, you know, with a, a uh, customer that has X current, so a core processing, the bank, their counterparty on the other end has to have X current. So we're in the, in the, in the process of building what we call RippleNet, the, the network of banks. And that rule book that I referenced governs the entire network. So the, the <coughs> a network's only as valuable as how many nodes in the network. Um, and so that now we are in sort of network building mode. And I was chatting earlier, we talked about how we value now, in terms of our business model, it's an enterprise software model, it's, there's an up upfront integration fee, subscription fee for every year, and then if you hit certain transactions, the transaction, per transaction fee kicks in. We are in a fortunate position where we don't care a whole lot about immediate term bookings and revenue. We care a whole lot more about getting the flywheel moving and getting volume pumping across the network because that means getting the 101st, 110th, 300th bank gets so much more easier because now the value of the network is far more apparent. But we're in that, that network building mode. Um, but again, all of those customers today can, can transact and, and move fiat currency around. They aren't restricted. I think it's a, a common misconception uh, about Ripple is that we're this XRP blockchain company, and yes, we leverage blockchain technology. The digital asset is an option. We think it's a hugely impactful option, but it's probably the next phase out. We have certain financial institutions, mostly money transfer businesses, MoneyGram, Western Union, and smaller versions of them that are already doing pilots with this um, XRapid product, and the reaction is super positive. Um, that's kind of the first wave of financial institutions that we think will adopt this before it becomes more um, prominent. So a fair question is great. Well, you know, you just said you can move f f value across the blockchain. Why not use Bitcoin? There's more of it. It's it's kind of the you know the 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 standard, if you will, in terms of market cap and everything else. I'm a fan of of Bitcoin. I think that the um, you know, uh, the store of value and what it, it, it does serves a great purpose. But when you think about Bitcoin versus XRP for a specific use case, the one that we're engaged with, and that's settling um, real payments, Ooh, we're a little biased, but we think that uh, XRP stands out really well. Um, we use a different way to validate transactions. Some of you follow the space at all, knows that, know that Bitcoin um, leverages something called proof of work where there's miners around the world that use tons and tons of compute power to solve a, a mathematical puzzle that ultimately validates the transaction. Um, as a result, you see on the left-hand side, there's some ramifications of that. Uh, to settle a transaction actually takes a long time. This used to be hours. When Bitcoin was surging, it was days. And it's down to 45 minutes. It still goes up and down. I forget if this was last month, but it's relatively recent. I won't read down the list, but in terms of, of transactions, uh, a number of transactions, so throughput, the amount of energy required, um, it, it, the, 
Bitcoin makes sense, but if you're trying to serve that high volume, low value payments use case, it really isn't the asset to use. It just doesn't line up um, to enable you know, the right end user experience and the right economics. And therefore, you know, XRP was developed by the, the same folks that founded Ripple. It, it was actually developed in it, you know, before Ripple was founded, but they had, they had been early on in the Bitcoin space and they saw some of the things that were deficient about um, Bitcoin, the scaling challenges, the, the, the energy consumption, and so they devised a different validation mechanism, we call it consensus, that um, results in sort of the, the, the metrics you see on the right-hand side that we think line up much better for the payments use case. Um, I want to get through this, so if there's any questions, sorry that I'm taking a while. This is our, our third product. Um, it's called XVIA. It's really for corporates. So the, the list of customers I showed at the start, the Ubers and the Airbnbs, right now they're, they're integrating into dozens of different um, banks around the world. Um, XVIA uh, gives them the opportunity to have one API that connects into RippleNet. And to your earlier question, as RippleNet is built out, all of their banking relationships will already be on RippleNet. So instead of having these bespoke integrations that are, in, you know, are, are forcing them to invest you know, scarce resources on something that really isn't their core competency. They're not payments companies, but they're today required to be more payments companies than they'd, they'd rather be. This is um, a product that we have out there uh, that will help address that need. And you know, all of these things, XCurrent, XRapid, XVIA, they all plug into RippleNet, and so they're all, they all connect with each other. They're, they themselves are interoperable as, as one uh, product family. So what does this mean for payments? Goodness, um, it's, it's, oh, and it's motherhood and apple pie. It's cheaper, um, it you can deals with this, this low value payment reality that's becoming more and more common in the industry. Um, exotic corridors, meaning uh, in markets like you know, US dollar to British pound or Euro, those are can't leave relatively efficient today, right? The, the FX rates between the two uh, result in very, th you know, thin spreads, uh, the ability to move money is somewhat efficient. When you're dealing with corridors, um, you know, as I said before, if you're trying to move money from Canada to Thailand, that currency pair isn't traded as much, the FX rate hit is far, um, uh, far greater, and so uh, this, this approach helps to address that in a pretty material way. And then there's that transparency piece, knowing all, kind of all throughout the payment life cycle what's happening, um, you know, if, if there's issues, uh, what the fees are in advance, confirmation that things are, 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 are completed is all kind of part and parcel what makes up this solution. Um, huh, I usually get this slide earlier on in the presentation. I'm not sure why it's here, but the point here is there's so many different use cases that are touted for the blockchain. Um, if you go to IBM's HyperWallet wiki page, you'll see 144 different potential use cases for the blockchain. Our perspective is if you have 144 use cases, you really don't have one, because right? you don't have focus. We think sort of the common denominator across all of that is payments. Most of the things that people point to, smart contracts, trade finance, security, there's some financial payment aspect involved. And we as a company have stayed really, really focused on trying to tackle this cross-border use case. We get a lot of people coming in and saying, hey, you could tweak your product and go after trade finance. And they're probably right. We think that um, it's so easy to get distracted, especially as a small company, that we've taken great pains to stay laser focused on the cross-border payments use case. That isn't to say that over time, we might move into the the um, other areas, but we feel really good about if we can solve this this payments use case and and really get um, broad adoption and, and and people buying into the fact that this interoperability driven by the interledger protocol that I mentioned um, is the de facto standard. We're well set up to do more, um, and that's it. We think the Internet of Value is is really that third piece of the puzzle that's going to drive a major change. Um, in, in fintech and finance. And with that, if you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Yeah. Um, one reason for the lead time of cross-border payment is due to the bank's uh, 
Okay, I see. Yep. Uh, so how do you call network just this part of Yeah, no, that reality still exists. It will exist. We, um, so a couple things. So again, when you deal with moving money around the world, especially this day and age, anti-money laundering, you know, looking at for, for entities or companies that are under OFAC sanctions or the, you know, sort of the, the terrorist watch list, it's, it's, it's serious business. And no matter how nimble and entrepreneurial you want to be, you can't get around that. And we, we actually hire a, we have a team of, and it may not sound like a lot, but for a company of 200, we probably have a dozen people in our regulatory and compliance group. Um, we work closely with banks, you know, their counterparties at the banks to try to uh, make those processes more efficient. Um, our integrations are, are not quick, and you know, this is part of, of the heavy lifting of building the network. You know, it'll take six to six to 12 weeks to actually implement the Ripple solution, and we are working you know, to make sure that we're going through those, those checks. Um, it is one of those things that you, you, you can't get around, nor do we want to. W one thing uh, on this note that I think is important, we are viewed, uh, some of you who follow Ripple um, might know this, we're viewed in the broader sort of blockchain Bitcoin space as a bit of a sellout, to be perfectly honest. So the blockchain is all about being sort of anarchistic. Right, you want, I mean, you know, down with the man, down with governments, <laughs> down with big companies, down with banks, they're the central counterparty that is you know, taking our stuff or charging usurious rates. We believe that the blockchain revolution, what we're doing actually works from, revolution from within rather than from out. We want to work with banks and regulators and governments to be more efficient and we invest a lot of time in doing so. Now we get a lot of arrows because of that because we're sellouts, and uh, you know it's ironic. Sort of in a contrarian movement, we're the contrarians. Like we're 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 not going with the flow. But we we believe strongly in the impact, and it's the right approach. I don't know if I exactly addressed your question, but I think we take it super seriously, and we invest a lot of time and money to sit down with banks and make sure that we're we're working with them versus trying to disintermediate them and trying to skirt around the government or the regulators. We think, we, we think that the, the, the digital asset space sh should be regulated, but it should be done in an intelligent way that it helps to preserve the innovation while protecting that, as opposed to just, you know, the proverbial throwing the baby out with the bathwater and just overly regulate and really restrict the innovation. Yeah? I, if there's a lot of money made in those inefficiencies by a lot of really important actors, yep. some of which you're trying to bundle together in this network, Yep. How do you guys manage that tension? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, as in most areas, the money's made disproportionately by the biggest of the big. So when you think about the correspondent banking ecosystem, and by far I don't <laughs> pretend to be uh, a deep expert, but it's the companies at the top of the food chain that tend to make the most. It's the cities, the HSBCs, the Bank of America Merrill Lynch's of the world. Because if you think about that daisy chain of correspondent banks, there's somebody at the at sort of at the, at the top, and they they're the ones that are disproportionately benefiting from those inefficiencies. It's sort of the innovator's dilemma. So our approach is to, you know, look maybe a, a, a layer, if not two layers, down, because there's other banks. And I was talking earlier that, you know, we have a banking partner in Santander, which maybe isn't a a, a worldwide known name, but it's a major super regional bank, Standard Chartered, um, a regional bank like Siam Commercial Bank in in Thailand they're not making the same money. In fact, they're paying fees up the food chain to the cities and the HSBCs of the world. So our approach, and we'll, we'll see if we're right, is to go and serve those folks really well. They're very motivated to find new ways to address this problem. And our, our bet is, now certainly we want the cities and the HSBCs to be Ripple customers as well. Um, one, they move super slowly, and to your point, they're not that they want to take meetings with us and get all the information they can, but they're not that serious about implementing our solution. We'll come back to them later once we have what we hope is a critical mass of some of these, and there's plenty of them. There's thousands and thousands of banks that are, are sort of at that next layer or two layers down. Yeah. Back to your, uh, your analogy in the X Rapid, where I'm moving, let's say, Canadian dollars to Malaysia. Mm -hmm. If my bank in Canada is converting Canadian dollars to XRP, 
and then sending XRP, and then my bank in Malaysia is taking the XRP. That's exactly the right. Malaysian currency. Where does the FX rate get set, and who sets it? And how do you guys think about that in a yeah. country where no, there's no Coinbase and no big exchange to kind of set the? Market? Yeah, no, and, and 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 that's absolutely right. And there, there's a progress. So, currently, what we do is we, we do work in in corridors where there is market makers like that. So our, our first corridor, maybe not surprisingly for X Rapid is US Mexico. So we work, um, so there's a small uh, uh, money service business called Qualix based in Texas and they serve um, Mexican workers that are sending funds back home to their family in, in Mexico. So what happens is we have relationships that we've helped coordinate with exchanges on both sides of that transaction. So in the US it's Bitstamp and in, in Mexico it's Bitso, both digital asset exchanges. So they're setting, they're setting the rates. So in some ways, it alleviates the need for Qualix, the financial institution in this case, to even hold XRP. They simply go, the risk is then um, absorbed by the digital exchange. That's their business, right? They're making markets, they know exchange rates. And, and there's, there's a fee involved with that. But they will give, or they may have a US dollar account at Bitstamp. Bitstamp, they'll say, hey, Bitstamp, send $1,000 worth of um, uh, pesos to this account in Mexico. Bitstamp converts the spot rate. It moves over the XRP ledger in eight seconds. It gets converted by Bitso on the other end into peso at the spot rate and then goes out on local rails to the ultimate bank account of the recipient. All of that t takes, because there's bank processes on either end that we can't fully control, it takes about 10 minutes, which used to be three days. And we've been told that the overall rate that they're seeing is 20 some odd basis points less than they would have seen otherwise, even taking into account FX fluctuations, et cetera, et cetera. Does, does Ripple set the, uh, the exchange that the banks are using, or do the banks get to decide which exchange, which, which, uh, exchange they want to open? Currently, we do is we're, we're building the markets. We want to make, I mean, a core thing since we're in the early stages is just liquidity of XRP. So XRP is a digital asset you know, trains only so much a day. And not only is daily volume important, but it's daily volume within the corridor in question because there, have to, there has to be enough liquidity in XRP on either end of that trade for it to go through. So we're, we're in the early stages, right? So they've done a pilot, they love it. We're going to production with them in this quarter. Um, I think all transactions are still less than 3,000 US dollars. But this is, you know, this is building, you know, in some ways, liquidity begets liquidity. Once, you, once trading start, volume starts to happen, uh, it happens uh, you know, more frequently and with more depth. So we are not at a stage where XRapid will be launched globally, worldwide. We, we're being very thoughtful about the progression and making sure that we're setting up the market, setting up the relationships, and definitely over time, it'll be m with more than one exchange to ensure that, those, that banks have options and that those trades happen um, you know, with the, with the intended results. Uh, and that's why it's funny, because right now, yeah, I think most people know that the, 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 the activity that's happening with digital assets, almost all speculation, right? I mean, there, there's very little real use case, and we would think that this X Rapid example is one of the first true use cases for that. It's an infinitesimal amount of the trading volume that happens each day. And people say, well, don't you think that the speculative volume that's being created is, is harmful? And at some level, yes. I mean, it's, it's very risky. We don't want people to go and spend their life saving. But it's sort of in, in making a, a market uh, in a currency like this, it's a necessary first step. You, you need to get, you know, you need to prime the pump and get volume started. So it starts building initial volume. And then certainly we think that the more commercial uh, specific use case volume will grow from there and create much more robust markets. Um, I'm going to go back and forth. I'll come back to you. Yes. Um, I'm curious to, to know as, um, what Ripple thinks about other digital assets that might serve as competition, like Stellar Lumens, and or you know competing against the Swift says, uh, system. How you guys are poised to mm -hmm. try and combat those types of competitors? Yeah, yeah. So Stellar Stellar is another digital asset. We actually have some common um, DNA there. The founder of, of Stellar was one of the co-founders of Ripple back in the day. Uh, he went off and had a different concept and created. Uh, the st Stellar Org and, and, and Lumens as a digital asset, and not surprisingly, because he kind of took the uh, XRP ledger base concept and code, there's a lot of similarities there. 
I mean, they're doing good work in terms of, of um, how the maturation of their technology and working with banks in the same way. Um, you know, what I described in terms of those product sets, the rule book, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it, it, it didn't happen overnight. Ripple has actually been around for five years and we've had a commercial product probably for the last two. And you know, there's a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of, frankly, scar tissue along the way of mistakes made with banks and whatnot. Um, you know, we have a team of 200 people. We've recruited some pretty amazing engineers. So nothing's guaranteed, but I feel that in terms of uh, where we are in our evolution, we're a little further down the development cycle and it's not that you can easily short circuit that. There are just some, work, I mean, especially when you're working with banks and, and regulatory agencies, those things don't kind of get accelerated quickly. You need to go through the process and build it. So I think they're you know, super uh, credible, but um, you know, we don't intend to slow down anytime soon and, and, and feel pretty good about how that will, um, will play out. Um, maybe one more, because I know we're running out of time. Um, I guess for emerging markets, it, sometimes I see payments as a, in terms of a problem as more with culture of taking these digital assets rather than yep. necessarily the technology.